You are a breakout star. You are privileged to be taken under the wing of a respected former champion who teaches you a lot about the pro wrestling business. However, the more you learn, you start to realize that you are advancing well past your mentor. How far are you willing to go before you have to strike out on your own? Tonight, B. Brian Blair asks himself this very question. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Tyler Vance Rants. I am your host, Tyler Vance himself. It is April 7th, 1984. Last week in the WWF, it was practically the Rowdy Roddy Piper show as he appeared all over that promotion's flagship show, Championship Wrestling. In the NWA, two championships changed hands. First, Tully Blanchard usurped the NWA television champion Mark Youngblood, while the Russian bear Ivan Koloff also managed to regain the NWA Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Championship from his rival, Angelo Mosca Jr. Speaking of Mark Youngblood, he and his tag team partner Chief Wahoo McDaniel are up first this week in tag team action against the team of Kurt Von Hess and Jeff Sword in a non-title match. David Crockett and Johnny Weaver are on commentary this week and they do their absolute best to make as many excuses for Mark Youngblood as he continues to struggle, this time in the ring against his opponents. It really makes me wonder what Chief Wahoo McDaniel has been teaching Mark Youngblood because unlike other green wrestlers like Angelo Mosca Jr., B. Brian Blair, Marky Mark Youngblood just seems to get worse every single week. Surprisingly, it is Mark Youngblood that does secure the win for his team as he hits a chop on Kurt Von Hess's head from the top rope. If this is the kind of quality that the NWA World Tag Team Champions are putting out, I don't think their reign will last very long. At the beginning of the episode, I did mention that Tully Blanchard recently won the NWA television champion from that loser Mark Youngblood, already proving that he is a champion to the core and significantly better than his predecessor, Tully Blanchard is putting the television championship on the line next against Brickhouse Brown. Paul Jones accompanies the champion to the ring and has negotiated with NWA officials that this title match will only be in effect for the first 10 minutes meaning that if Brickhouse Brown cannot secure a pinfall or a submission in that time frame, despite the match being allowed to continue, he will not become champion if winning after that period of time. That means that Brown will have to put absolutely everything he's got on the line here if he hopes to walk away the new television champion. Brickhouse must have heard me because he starts the match off like a house on fire and gives Tully Blanchard a beating of his lifetime. Both men get into an excellent back and forth before the television champion starts to focus on his opponent's legs. The challenger Brown keeps himself in the match and even goes so far as to get several near falls on the television champion, but Tully Blanchard is the champion for a reason. Hitting Brickhouse Brown with an impressive back suplex, the NWA television champion retains the title. In episode 1 of Tyler Vance Rants, titled Hulkamania is Born, I made mention that Ricky Steamboat recently announced that he'd be retiring from the sport of professional wrestling due to injury. Steamboat did eventually recover, and he did return to wrestling thanks in large part due to a bribe from Jim Crockett Jr., then going on to face the nature boy Ric Flair for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. Despite failing, this all took place on March 17th during the Boogeyman Jam, which I also have an episode about, and you should check it out. What's weird here is that we are shown the same video package that we were shown on January 7th, which makes me feel like I'm about to be told of Steamboat's imminent demise. Instead, David Crockett informs us that Ricky Steamboat's return to pro wrestling is, in fact, permanent. It seems that Ricky's thirst for championship gold was reinvigorated despite losing against Flair for the World Heavyweight Championship. Apparently, he is going to continue hounding Flair for the World Heavyweight Championship, and someone besides myself that has a problem with that is Dirty Dick Slater. Slater comes out to be interviewed by David Crockett, however, it just eventually devolves into an argument between the two over the controversy. The controversy being the fact that Dick Slater beat NWA World Heavyweight Champion, the Nature Boy Ric Flair, 
fair and square several months ago, a decision which was overturned by the NWA Board of Directors. David Crockett then points out that the World Heavyweight Championship in Dirty Dick Slater's possession is a replica. Well, yeah, David, the real one is still in the illegal possession of Ric Flair. And Ric Flair, if you want me, you gotta beat the man! And Dick Slater is the man. David Crockett's next guests are the Boogie Woogie Maniac, Jimmy Valiant, Junkyard Dog, and a newcomer, Brian Adidas. Adidas starts things off by saying he's glad to be allied with Jimmy Valiant in his ongoing war against Paul Jones's army. The trio then begin to sing folk songs? Well, me and my girl went huckleberry hunting. She fell down and I kept on picking. In between taking turns shouting and rambling incoherently, making the occasional threat towards anybody they can think of, like the assassin, Paul Jones. I mean, let's throw Dick Slater in there for no reason. All the while, David Crockett stands by wondering if he's suddenly entered a fever dream. The Russian bear Ivan Koloff and the pride of the Carolinas Don Kernodal are accompanied to the ring by their manager Gary Hart in tag team competition next against the team of Vinny Valentino and Bret Hart. No matter how impressive Valentino and Hart may be in one-on-one -on -one competition, they stand absolutely no chance against the longtime team of the Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Champion Ivan Koloff and Don Kernodal who does secure the win for his team following a clothesline from the top rope. One of the resident lunatics in the Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling area, the Junkyard Dog, is taking on another of Gary Hart's clients, this time the Great Kabuki. The duo have a standoff at the beginning of the match. The Great Kabuki stands by with his weapon, the Psy, while Junkyard Dog has his trusty chain. When the two eventually do start wrestling, Punches, kicks, the occasional throw, those are what we see, nothing fancy. The Great Kabuki's patented nerve pinch almost puts the Junkyard Dog away, but that mangy mutt fights back. Gary Hart then tries to interfere in the match once his client gets thrown over the ropes onto the mat below. In the confusion and the ensuing scuffle, the Great Kabuki manages to spit a red mist right into the Junkyard Dog's face. If you remember the last time this happened, King Kong, Angelo Mosca Sr. lost 20% vision in his right eye to the mist. Maybe it'll teach that dumb dog some new tricks. Keep your nose out of this war and no further harm will come to you, JYD. Worldwide Wrestling's main event sees the former Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Champion, Angelo Mosca Jr. in singles competition with Ben Alexander. Once upon a time, Alexander proved to be a mighty test for the young Mosca. But that was several months ago, and this is no longer the case. While Ben does manage to get a few lucky shoulder tackles and tosses here and there, he is absolutely no chance for Mosca Jr. Mosca Jr. deploys a very impressive looking move that I've not seen him use before in the Boston Crab, but Ben Alexander has been around the block. He gets the ropes, forcing the young Mosca to break the hold. Another back and forth briefly ensues between the pair before Angelo Mosca heads to the top rope. Scoring a flying crossbody on Alexander, it isn't a surprise to see Angelo come away with a 1, 2, 3. Before we tune into the WWF, David Crockett has one more interview to conduct, this time with the big cat, Ernie Ladd. Crockett straight up lies, stating that Ernie Ladd stole Rufus R. Jones' $1,000 last week. What the hell are you talking about, David? The challenge was, whether he won or not, for simply participating, Ernie Ladd would win $1,000 of Rufus's money. The big cat stole nothing, you poor excuse for an announcer. I'm beginning to like the big cat's mindset. He says he will get back in the ring with Rufus R. Jones, but first he's gotta pony up some more money. $1,000, $2,000, it doesn't matter. As long as there's money, so will the big cat be there. Don Kernodal and Ivan Koloff are David Crockett's guests next, and the new Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Champion, the Russian Bear, states that he has embodied his new status as an American citizen perfectly with continued success in the ring. Kernodal then catapults off of this, stating that he and Koloff will now be challenging and targeting the new NWA World Tag Team Champions, Chief Wahoo McDaniel 
and Mark Youngblood. The Pride of the Carolinas then extends an invitation to any tag team out there in professional wrestling to come down to the Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling area so that he and Ivan Koloff can beat them too. Worldwide wrestling comes to an end, but WWF Championship Wrestling is just about to begin. Gene Okerlund and Vince McMahon welcome us to the show, and we start the program off with the WWF's World Tag Team Champions, Tony Atlas and Rocky Johnson, taking on the team of Tony Colon and Johnny Ringo in a non-title match. The match itself is a completely one-sided affair, which allows the World Tag Team Champions to demonstrate just exactly what they're made of. Cologne falls to Atlas's military press splash combination, and it dawns on me that Johnny Ringo didn't even get an opportunity to participate in this match. Poor guy. While Piper's Pit may be my favorite segment of the week, Vince McMahon's Tyler Vance rants rip off the WWF update is my least favorite. All the update is, is just gossip and speculation. Last week, McMahon just simply told us about a shopping spree undertaken by the former World Wrestling Federation World Heavyweight Champion, the Iron Sheik. This week, we're told how great Jimmy Superfly Snooka is and shown a video package of his finisher, the Top Rope Splash. Vince then reminds us that Snooka was named the WWF Magazine 1983 Wrestler of the Year before going on to make a claim that he'll be in the contention for the same award of 1984. I don't think so. A By the Numbers affair took place next between Jose Luis Rivera and Dr. D. David Schultz. Encouraged by his manager, Roddy Piper, Dr. D won fast following a diving elbow from the second rope. Why can't you give somebody give me some competition, huh? Seriously, what's going on with the quality of wrestling on the WWF programs? I've seen better wrestling from Israel Matia. Charlie Fulton does battle with the Cobra Corps Commandant Sergeant Slaughter in singles competition next, while the Marine is accompanied by his aide, Sergeant Terry Daniels. And the crowd chants USA, USA at both competitors because everybody's a proud American tonight. Yeehaw! Unfortunately for Fulton, the USA chants don't seem to have the same effect that they do on him like they do with Sergeant Slaughter. Whereas the staff sergeant seems to get really pumped up once he hears those chants start to get going, Fulton remained indifferent, and this led to him being caught by the Commandant's Cobra Clutch. When Cowboy Bob Orton takes on the Tonga Kid in singles competition next, Rowdy Roddy Piper makes his way to the ringside area for the second week in a row to cheer the Cowboy on. It's not long before Piper offers some free advice to Orton, but despite this advantage, the Tonga Kid proves his high-flying athletic ability by throwing Orton around the ring and hitting him with some drop kicks. Bob Orton does eventually manage to catch the kid and hits him with a superplex from the top rope to secure the win. It's my favorite segment of the week, Piper's Pit. This week, Rowdy Roddy Piper's guest is the Polish power, Ivan Putski. Once the duo start to conduct the interview, it doesn't take long before the Scotsman starts to target the Poles' ethnicity. You see, you guys, you guys come over here, you kill me, you come over here, and right away you're coming over here, <laughs> little rank. <laughs> Piper then goes to make it very clear that despite the fact that the Polish power does have a fantastic body, Piper is not intimidated by him. You come out here flexing your muscles, doesn't entertain me a bit, doesn't psych me out a bit, doesn't do nothing. The final nail of the coffin is surprisingly, despite everything, Putski's singing skills. Once Piper makes fun of those, game over. I see you get up here in the ring, and you get up and you sing. I would rather listen to Lassie Bark than listen to you sing, brother. You don't like my singing? I wouldn't have it. Turn it off, turn it off. The Iron Sheik just simply can't seem to get a break. When he heads down to the ring with his manager Ayatollah Blassi to face off against Lee Wong, he is absolutely attacked by the crowd who pelt him and Blassi with garbage while chanting That's just offensive. The Iron Sheik 
came here to wrestle, and more importantly, win. So he puts Wong immediately into the camel clutch and calls it a day. I have some advice for you Americans. Seethe. Cope. Tag team action is up again next, this time between Afa and Sika, the Wild Samoans, who are accompanied by their manager, Captain Lou Albano. The Samoans are set to face off against the mentor-mentee team of Tony Gurria and B. Brian Blair. Brian Blair is the standout of this match. His tag team partner, Gurria, spends most of the time being out-wrestled, and it isn't long before the former WWF World Tag Team Champion gets stuck in enemy territory. Afa's terrifying visage would be enough for me to forfeit the match, but somehow Tony Gurria musters the courage to continue fighting. He gets a tag to Blair, which saves the day for their team. It's at this point that the match just simply devolves into absolute chaos. The fault lies solely with Tony Gurria, who refused to get out of the ring as instructed by the referee, instead opting to attack any of the wild Samoans that he could get his hands on. If it wasn't for Gurria's ego, he and B. Brian Blair could have walked away the victors here. Instead, both them and the Wild Samoans lose, and nobody wins. Double disqualification. Brian Blair, you need to leave Gurria in the dust. Strike out on your own. It's the only way that you're going to be successful. The main event of WWF Championship Wrestling and the week sees Israel Matia take on Johnny Rivera, who shares no relation to Jose Luis Rivera. During the match, it's announced by Vince McMahon and Gene Okerlund that next week, the WWF World Heavyweight Champion Hulk Hogan will finally be returning to television and will be facing Tiger Chun Li in a non-title match. It is about time. Rivera scores a flying crossbody win over Mattia after a slow and methodical match, which brings the week to an end. In the NWA, it was announced that Ricky Steamboat would be returning to wrestling full-time and is already in contention for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. The big cat Ernie Ladd says he'll get back into the ring with Rufus R. Jones as long as more money is put on the table, and Tully Blanchard successfully defended his NWA Television Championship against Brickhouse Brown. On the WWF side, Rowdy Roddy Piper unsurprisingly made another enemy, this time in the Polish power Ivan Putski. We were told that the WWF World Heavyweight Champion Hulk Hogan will be returning to singles competition next week, and Tony Gurria cost he and B. Brian Blair a guaranteed victory due to his ego. There are moments when you have to take a step back and try to look at the big picture. If you're Tony Gurria, you have to realize that you have had a very successful career up until this point, particularly in the tag team division. Your legacy has been cemented. There's nothing more for you to prove. Your job is to now mold your protege, B. Brian Blair, into the next five-time WWF World Tag Team Champion, Tony Gurria. Instead, Gurria doesn't seem to understand the responsibility that has been placed on his shoulders. He instead seems to be using the very talented B. Brian Blair to his advantage for a chance at one more run for glory. My only hope is that B. Brian Blair realizes this before it's too late and strikes out on his own so that his career can truly begin to shine. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Tyler Vance Rants. All of the episodes that I mentioned throughout this show will be linked in the description below. By the way, while you're down there, don't forget to like the video, subscribe, hit the bell so you never miss a beat, and you can also follow me on social media where I hope you will share this video with your family and friends. So long for now. I will see you next week. Slick. In the NWA, two championships changed. Going down to Tim's for a double double, eh? Another brief back and forth ensues between the pair. Crockett flat out lies, stating that earn that blah blah blah. Tony Colon falls to Atlas's military press splash combination. I'm gonna start that over again. Sounds like I'm struggling. <laughs>